Scotland's history, as the history of all nations, is a tale of dizzying contrasts, of brotherhood and barbarism, of superstition and scientific innovation, of nobility and slavery and exploitation. Perhaps nowhere are these contrasts more starkly seen than in a series of bizarre crimes that took place here in the nation's capital 200 years ago. Come back with us to the early years of the 19th century, as medical science forged forward, as body snatchers prowled the churchyards. The narrow streets of Edinburgh became the stalking ground for a new species of ghoul. This is the world of Burke and Hare. In early May of 1828, a woman from Glasgow checked into a boarding house that once stood not far from where I'm standing now. Her name is not recorded, nor is her reason for making the 45 mile journey on foot. It's likely that she was poor for the boarding house housed mainly itinerant labourers and vagrants. What is recorded is that she made the journey with a mute 12 year old boy, most likely her son. On the night of the 6th of May, Two men entered the woman's room and stood over her as she slept. One of the men pinned her to the bed while the other clamped his hand over her mouth and pinched shut her nose until she died of asphyxiation. One of the men then fetched her son, who was warming himself by the kitchen fire, led the boy to his mother's room and snapped his spine with his bare hands. This was not an isolated atrocity. At the time of this appalling double murder, People had been going missing around Edinburgh's West Port area for seven months. The poor, the elderly, the infirm, scavengers and prostitutes were being systematically targeted. People who, in a society that did not care well for those on its fringes, could easily fall through the gaps without being missed. The disappearance of mother and son was met with as little interest as their arrival. It is a modus operandi we continue to see today in cases of serial murder. But the Edinburgh of the 19th century wasn't all violence and poverty. There was another side to the city, one that still basked in the afterglow of the Scottish Enlightenment, the period in which great advancements in scientific, philosophical and cultural spheres blossomed across Scotland. For all the Enlightenment's promotion of rational and humanist ideas, the attitudes of ordinary people towards death, and the attitudes of many of those in power, remained mired in superstition and this was putting restrictions on the supply of the most valuable anatomical resource of all, human corpses. Because the concept of body bequeathal was then unknown, unthinkable even, for the doctrine of the physical resurrection of the body was still staunchly adhered to, the main legitimate source for cadavers was the state, which donated an annual ration of executed criminals to the medical schools. But the same enlightenment that had fed the expansion of medical science had also helped instill new, more liberal ideas in the criminal justice system. Fewer mere shoplifters or horse thieves now found themselves upon the gallows, which were increasingly the sole stomping ground of violent offenders and those who committed crimes against the Crown. The anatomist's supply chain was fast drying up. The anatomists of Surgeon Square were forced to ghoulish lengths to meet the demand. By night, the cemeteries of Edinburgh became the haunt of body snatchers. Like vultures, these opportunistic tomb raiders would swoop upon recent internments in the dead of night, digging up graves and breaking open tombs to get at the valuable remains inside. The corpses thus acquired were sold clandestinely to the anatomists of Surgeon Square, who were more than happy to turn a blind eye to their provenance. Such was the public outrage at the sleep of the dead being violated in this manner that some churchyards erected manned lookout towers like the one behind me in New Calton Cemetery for the sole purpose of defending the dead against the living. The body trade was clearly a thriving one, but it was an imperfect solution to the cadaver shortage. With days, sometimes weeks, between the point of death and the point of sale, the merchandise had the reputation for being less than fresh. There is only so much one can learn from a bloated, worm-riddled corpse. 
But with death a hot commodity, this growing city of 160,000 lives was a vast resource waiting to be exploited. It was only a matter of time before someone had the idea to cut out the middleman, someone with the ruthlessness to start converting those lives into merchandise. A decade before the murders began, a young man from County Tyrone in Northern Ireland abandoned his wife and two children and travelled to Scotland to work as a labourer on the construction of the Union Canal. His name was William Burke. And it may have been here that he first met the man who would become his accomplice in murder, William Hare. Also an Irishman, also a navvy on the canal, Hare had fled Ireland as a fugitive after killing his employer's horses in a fit of rage. Hare's wife, Margaret, ran the boarding house on Tanner's Close in the West Port. At the Hare's invitation, Burke eventually moved into a spare room at the hostel, along with his mistress, a Ms. Helen McDougall. Once all the key players were in place, it was only a matter of a few weeks before the slaughter began. The inception, the catalyst for the atrocities to come, was the death of an old age pensioner on November 29, 1827. The man, named Donald, died a natural and unremarkable death in one of the rooms at Margaret's boarding house, owing her a debt of four pounds. But Mr and Mrs Hare were not the sort of landlords who let a thing like rent slide just because a tenant was dead. The old man's departure would prove to be the solution to the very problem it caused. On the eve of the funeral, Burke and Hare pried the lid off Donald's coffin. They removed the body and weighted the empty casket with tanning bark. They then stuffed his corpse inside a barrel and brought it to Surgeon Square. They found a willing buyer in Dr. Robert Knox. Probably the leading anatomist of his day, Knox routinely dealt with body snatchers as a means of procuring cadavers and so was not given to asking questions. He paid Burke and Hare seven pounds and ten shillings for the remains of old Donald. Burke and Hare couldn't believe their luck. This was the equivalent of nearly a thousand pounds today. It covered the cost of the unpaid rent with more than enough left over to vigorously celebrate their successful transaction. The bounty was all the encouragement they needed to pursue this line of business further. But there was one small hurdle to overcome. Dead pensioners didn't crop up with quite the required regularity. There was one other tenant who suffered from a long-term illness. Joseph was his name. But, wait as they might, he stubbornly refused to shuffle off. You can almost hear Burke and Hare rationalising it to themselves. It wouldn't be killing him so much as helping him on his way. It was with Joseph, their first murder victim, that Burke and Hare invented what would become their trademark mode of execution, restraining him on the floor while forcibly clamping shut his mouth and nose. A slow and terrifying death, it nevertheless left not a trace of violence on the body, nothing that would raise suspicions as to the cadaver's provenance and no devaluing marks upon the merchandise. Not only had Burke and Hare found a lucrative enterprise, they had discovered a new talent and a special pleasure in the undertaking. Joseph, incidentally, earned them ten pounds. Having now committed murder, the conspirators stood to lose nothing further, legally or morally, by repeating the act. As Burke himself would later put it, we might as well be hanged for a sheep as for a lamb. The killings began in earnest, committed with such efficiency and stealth that the details of several of the victims remain obscure, known only from the killer's own confessions. The third victim was an unknown woman lured to Tanner's close by Margaret, who plied her with alcohol until Mr. Hare arrived to suffocate her. The fourth was another stranger, murdered by Burke acting alone. Again, both bodies were delivered to Knox for a cash reward. Next, Burke and Hare picked up Mary Patterson and Janet Brown, teenage sex workers who made their living around the West Port. As before, they supplied their guests with large volumes of whiskey as a means of sedation. This worked well enough on Patterson, who quickly fell into a drunken slumber, but Janet Brown stayed sober enough to excuse herself when an argument broke out between William Burke and Helen McDougall. She vowed to return in the morning to collect her friend, but when she did, she was told that Mary had left the premises with Burke. 
Janet waited at Tanner's close for several hours until her own concerned landlady sent for her to return home. Mary never did return because she had never left. Her suffocated body was stuffed inside a tea chest in Burke's room, awaiting a trip to Surgeon Square. As the body count rose, as their thirst for blood grew, and as the finger of suspicion consistently failed to turn in their direction, the conspirators of Tanner's Close were growing more brazen in their crimes. Mary Patterson had not been dying or destitute, nor was she a stranger to the city, but a well-known, well-liked and, by some, well-frequented street character. Eventually, their audacity would stretch as far as murdering their own relatives, as in the case of Helen McDougall's cousin, Anne, invited in by Helen and smothered to death by William Hare. Among their many victims at this time was a young man called James Wilson. Known locally as Daft Jamie, James suffered from what we'd now term a learning disability, and like Mary Patterson, was a common sight in the West Port. Jamie was something of a minor celebrity, earning his crust as a street clown entertaining the locals with songs and jokes. When he showed up in Knox's dissecting theatre, a number of his students immediately recognised the boy. Gossip had already been circulating about Knox, ever since a number of his students, who also happened to be former clients of Mary, had attended a lecture in which the anatomist had dissected a body that bore a striking resemblance to the missing prostitute. But this time, with Jamie's distinctive facial features and club foot, there seemed to be no margin for error, and much less stigma in coming forward. There is still debate as to how much Knox really knew about the activities of Burke and Hare, but how he responded to the concerns of his students perhaps gives us a hint, if not to the nature of his involvement with the murderers, at least then of his attitude toward the people on his table. He didn't contact the authorities, he didn't make inquiries, he sharply denied that the corpse was Jamie and immediately dissected the head and foot to prevent further identification. His business relationship with Burke and Hare continued without interruption. The final victim of the Westport killers was one Mary Doherty, an old Irish woman whom Burke and Helen met on the street. The killers leveraged their common nationality to convince Mary that she was in fact a distant relative, thus luring her back to the lodging house. Being based in a boarding house had its benefits for an operation like Burke and Hare's with its high turnover of new faces, but it also had its downsides. Chief among these was the lack of privacy. And so it was on Halloween 1828, when Burke and Hare had to sit and make polite conversation with their would-be victim while they waited for James and Anne Gray, a pair of fellow lodgers, to go out for the evening. Unfortunately for Mary, they eventually did so and Burke applied his well-practiced skills to the extinction of this amiable, trusting old woman. But, crucially, the Greys had seen and spoken to the murdered woman, placing her in the boarding house and in the company of William and Helen. Returning to their lodgings and finding Burke strangely reluctant to let anyone near his room, the inquisitive Greys sneaked a peek under his bed, and there they found the suffocated corpse of Mary Doherty. Horrified, the pair immediately fled the premises, but en route to alert the authorities, they were intercepted by Helen McDougall. McDougall offered them £10 a week in return for their silence, more than enough to lift any struggling family from a life of poverty. The Greys, testament to their decency, refused it. Police descended upon the boarding house, but Burke and Hare had managed to hastily deliver the body to Knox by the time they arrived. Nevertheless, Burke and McDougall were placed under arrest, and an anonymous tip, probably from one of Knox's students, led investigators to Surgeon Square, where Doherty's remains were uncovered. William and Margaret Hare were also arrested. The murder spree was at an end. Their death toll, including women, men, children and the elderly, stood at 16. With the killers in custody, a body in the morgue and witnesses on hand, it should have been an open and shut case. It would have been too, had it not been for the strange method of execution that Burke and Hare had utilised. Because Mary Doherty had suffocated, without any external injuries or defensive wounds, coroners could not confidently establish the cause of death. This left the defence with a large opportunity to challenge the charge of murder, which all parties denied. It looked increasingly likely 
that all parties might walk free. Burke was considered the most intelligent member of the group, callous, calculating, accompanied with what we might now describe as a certain psychopathic charm. As the nominal leader, it was decided that if any among them should by no means escape justice, it was him. And so William Hare was offered immunity from prosecution on the condition that he testified against Burke. As you might imagine, Hare jumped at the opportunity to save himself from the gallows. As a result, Burke was convicted, and at the sentencing, Lord Justice Clark, David Boyle, made the following pronouncement. You now stand convicted, by the verdict of a most respectable jury of your country, of the atrocious murder charged against you in this indictment. Upon evidence which carried conviction to the mind of every man that heard it, your body should not be exhibited in chains in order to deter others from the like crimes in time coming, Taking into consideration that the public eye would be offended with so dismal an exhibition, I am disposed to agree that your sentence shall be put in execution in the usual way, but accompanied with the statutory attendant of the punishment of the crime of murder, viz. that your body should be publicly dissected and anatomized. And I trust that if it is ever customary to preserve skeletons, yours will be preserved, in order that posterity may keep in remembrance of your atrocious crimes. At a quarter past eight on the 28th of January, under a blackened sky, 25,000 souls gathered at the Lawn Market gallows in the pounding rain to watch William Burke die at the noose. The next day, his body was publicly dissected. Tickets to the event sold out, and police had to be called when a riot almost broke out amongst the many would-be attendees denied entry. Neither Helen McDougall nor Margaret Hare were convicted, both receiving the peculiarly Scottish verdict of not proven. They were released, only to be forced into police protection by outraged mobs who then besieged the police station. There are later accounts of McDougall being driven out of both Stirling and Newcastle on different occasions by violent gangs, and the final record of her existence has the Newcastle authorities delivering her to Durham, at which point she melts back into the mists of history. Margaret Hare was reunited with her husband upon his release, and after leaving Edinburgh, the pair were hounded out of first Dumfries, then Carlisle, and finally Scarva in Northern Ireland, before dropping off the map. Folk tales have William Hare thrown in a pit of quicklime and blinded, living the rest of his days as a homeless beggar, but there is very little to actually back this up, and in all likelihood, the Hares simply changed their names and laid low or emigrated. In fact, it's entirely plausible there are descendants of the pair alive today. Robert Knox was never charged with any crime. As is all too often the case, even now, a privileged background, the right connections, and enough lackeys between himself and the deed all seem to have served as very effective defences. Knox never spoke about his dealings with Burke and Hare, and was not involved in the anatomization of Burke, which fell to Alexander Munro Tertius of the University of Edinburgh Medical School. During the dissection, Munro wrote with a quill upon a scrap of paper, This is written with the blood of William Burke, who was hanged at Edinburgh. This blood was taken from his head. A death mask was taken of Burke's face, and a written account of the murders was bound in his own tanned skin. These artefacts remain in the collection of Edinburgh's Surgeon's Hall Museum. His preserved skeleton remains on display in the Anatomical Museum at Edinburgh University, exactly as ordered by the sentencing judge on Christmas Day 1828. But the crimes committed by Burke and his accomplices had another legacy, a rather more positive one. The horrific revelations in the press and the public outrage that followed helped open the eyes of those in power and the public at large to the backwards and outmoded legal situation surrounding educational access to cadavers. Within three years, Parliament had passed the Anatomy Act of 1832. This allowed public authorities to donate unclaimed dead bodies to scientific study and made provision for medical institutions to accept bodies presented by next of kin on the condition that the institution covered burial expenses. On the new law's introduction, an anonymous editorial in the medical journal The Lancet 
proclaimed, Burke and Hare, it is said, are the real authors of the measure, and that which would never have been sanctioned by the deliberate wisdom of Parliament is about to be extorted from its fears. It would have been well if this fear had been manifested and acted upon before sixteen human beings had fallen victims to the supineness of the government and legislature. Although initially controversial, it was this act, pushed through in response to the crimes of Burke and Hare, that finally and decisively laid to rest the secret trade in body snatching and murder. So what do you think became of William and Margaret Hare? Was the famous Knox a willing accessory to serial murder? Or perhaps there's another dark chapter of Scotland's history that you'd like to see us explore in a future episode. Please leave a comment and don't forget to subscribe to Ghastly Tales for more dark documentaries, fiction narrations, true horrors and more. We hope you've enjoyed this grisly tale from Scotland's past. While we prepare to bring you another, feel free to peruse the Ghastly Tales archive. But be careful how deep you delve.